Welcome back, what everybody. Is up? Alex, so what have you been doing? You've been uh, in, you've been hiding in COVID? Yeah, yeah, I've been hiding, I've been hiding in the, like the hills of New Mexico. You've been, I know, you've been everywhere. Canyons. Yeah. I mean, canyons. I've been, in, I saw you and your Florida. dog were jumping into water. Oh my, it was great. Yeah. <laughs> I've been down to Florida for the SpaceX launch and everything. That's crazy. Was it, uh, was it as amazing as? No. It, it was, wasn't that amazing. It's actually very <laughs> anticlimactic. Did you ever launch Estes rockets when you were younger? Yes, yeah, with the little with the little motors on the bottom, and yeah. then you turn the little thing, and then it yeah. goes. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. a great noise. Yeah. yeah, it's like that, just bigger. I like the smell. Oh, the smell was great. It was it gunpowder, right? Uh, well, yeah, it it, like a, yeah, it's like gunpowder. It's solid rocket fuel. Yeah, because that always smelled amazing. That part I that was my favorite. Yeah, you know, I, you like. <laughs> I'm like gun dude. So <laughs> wait, wait, hold on. You know when you go fill a car up and you get that like the smell of gas? Oh yeah, dude, yeah, yeah. Dude, I don't know why. <laughs> it's kind of like a thing. Huh? I know it's not. You're good. not like a motorhead, so it's no. just the idea of the just like, yeah, yeah. You know, it's like, like that oh, little. Yeah. yeah, some people love that, like the oil, the grease, I don't the know car. Why. I like uh, I like when cars shoot flames out of. I always oh, you get a little engine cool. pop. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And there's a the guy comes by with his like subi. Shakes your, <laughs> his subi. He's just like, oh, yeah, it's so silly. Yeah, a subi. <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, I saw some. There's been a lot of in COVID. There's been a lot of racing going on. Uh, I was talking to a cop the other day, and he was saying that. Oh yeah, and no, he didn't hurt me. Bombing around. Everybody's yeah. like, <laughs> "All good." Uh, let's talk about that real quick before we get into this. I, I, I think this is, I, had, I had a dream last night, and I knew you were going to ask me about this because I think this is really relevant. Because uh, I mean, this will be going out soon. Um, we have a lot of. I got asked to be on a committee here in the city for police reform. Oh, good for you. Um, so uh, it. it it's one of the things that I learned in the military was, um, and w- w- we're going to get into this. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but is that you fall to the level of your training. Yeah. And so in the military, we, if we were not doing missions or doing something serious, we were always training because we knew we'd be put in that situation and, and we just need instinct to take over. Right. And I see, you know, whenever I see things like what happened, how horrific that was, you know, um, and, and that certain individual had like 18 complaints against him already. And I think after three, you'd be gone, but <laughs> after the first one you should be like, let's go take a psychological exam. Yeah, exactly. So when we, when we look at, when we're looking at, you know, what went on and then, you know, murder basically. And, but it, what I, what really polarized me about, cause I watched the whole video and it was just terrific. Word. Yeah. Was everyone around him, the other officers around him. That's what really bugged me. Why didn't you do anything about it? Yeah, it, it was like, because I'd be, I'd be like, hey, you know, you, I mean, you would come to be like, Jason, knock it off. You know, you're being I'd tackle a you. fucking idiot. I would you know tackle what I mean? you. Yeah, 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 exactly. What, what the, what's wrong with you, you know? Yeah. And, and there would be that brotherhood, that camaraderie that went on. You know, in the military, we always did that with each other. We always kept each other in check, you know? It, not, yeah. not that we would do anything like that, but I, I feel like something is causing this this i know we we've always had racism and to me it's just uh, and we we did a whole po- podcast on white privilege and stuff like that so people can go back and listen to that but when we, whenever we look at racism or hate cuz that's really what it is mm. ignorance and hate correct what do you wh- what do you see when you look at um racism what are you seeing out there yeah um racism is like all things it's a function of perspective so if you look at a lot of the studies and they've done this with very young children that they say, okay, tell me what you see in this picture. You know, there's a black kid, there's an Indian kid, you know, right. and there's like 30 white kids. Like, of course, those are the ratios. Nice job. <laughs> and they're like, oh, they're playing, they're hugging, they're kissing, you know? Oh, can you see anything else? In it? Oh, yeah, well, he's happy, he's sad. What else can you tell me about him? Oh, you know, his hair's curly. Yeah, okay. they, don't, they don't look at... They have no conscious perspective or um, programming towards the thought of what racism is, that sort of differentiation. The innocence in the child's vision looks at it as they're just another another being, another right. entity, right? And they're they're looking at the emotions and the actions, not the classification. Yeah, this is really good. I like where your thought process is on this. So when you ask me, you know, what are my thoughts on the racist aspects of it? When you look at racism, racism is that function over time, it's a learned perspective. And so just like anything else we could learn, just like anything else. And it, this is going to sound stupid, but it's, it's very simply solved. It's simply solved. But the question is, do people want to do it? And that framework of education comes from the fact of, you know, 
are you going to teach people that there is a shared part of the human spirit that we all have? Where truly there's nothing different between any of us, these meat sacks that we have, right, these, right. these instruments, right? These are instruments for the spirit that we have inside of ourselves. And when you can get people to have that sort of perspective, racism isn't really an, a thing. Then you begin to truly understand. I think reincarnation helps you with that too. Uh, yeah, it does. Because it does. When, when you when you believe in reincarnation and you look at, you know, I mean, you can come back as... I mean, any color, anything. Yeah, absolutely. Purple, anything. pink, yeah, yellow, and you could be a man or a woman. You <laughs> right. know what I mean? A bug, any, a, any sort of sex, right? And so, if if you take a, just an observational view, a critical observational view of everything that happens around you in nature, everything happens in cycles. Everything dies and regrows. These are the natural, truthful functions of what creation does itself. And so you're just like, okay, if I am a piece of this nature, this thing that I'm viewing then I must have to apply or abide by those same principles internally that's going on with me. Okay, all right. So if I constantly come back, this body dies, but there's something that animates it and keeps it moving forward, then there's this this internal spirit, the life of life, you right. would call it. Then this life of life would tell me that there really isn't anything different. We all share a sliver of the total part of creation, right? So if you have like a sense of like the super spirit, like this big piece of consciousness, this huge ball of energy, the spiritual energy of creation, we're a little sliver of it. And that's the thing that gives us the energy to animate. And that little sliver is not black or white or yellow. No, it has no color. Yes. It doesn't live in a coarse material world that we live in. It lives in a fine, fluid, immaterial world. But this immaterial world permeates everything. And when you have the perspective of that permeation, that understanding of that, that spiritual light that sits inside someone else that we all share, then you can truly identify and unify with another individual outside of any sort of difference they might have in a material sense. But that material sense only makes up a small fraction of, again, the greater part of Yeah, and every every great teacher that's been out there, whether it's Buddha, you know, I mean, Jesus over and over and over again hit racism. I mean, you know, there was even, he went against class, he went against religion, he went against everything. But when you look at, and what we're going to talk about today, you know, there's questions that, people talk about when they have this sorrow, this hate, this anger that's inside of them. And I know what we're going to get in today, it addresses all of these um, ethical and moral struggles that are in our human life. Yeah. And those struggles, it, material existence is a struggle in and of itself. We have all these things that happen on our journeys and through this experience we learn. And then from that, de- that develops our spirit Okay, and the spirit is the thing that always comes back. You have this consciousness of this life, right? But the spirit lives in this consciousness block. It's like the totality of all your lives, all those consciousness sit there. But right now you're in this existence, this experience. And so how are you going to go back and reach into and reform and add to this this block of information that is your foundation that you actually spiritually evolve on? And so when you talk about hate and racism and all of those heavily anchoring negative you know, darker things, it needs to be viewed from an experiential point of learning and you cannot overcome those or integrate them properly unless you understand the hate within yourself first Mm. and understand how that hate and that racism and that perspective is an untruth. It doesn't follow creational laws properly. Right. It doesn't agree with what the human spirit does. So it puts you in this weird like dark area where nothing's really happening. You're in a constant stalemate with yourself. There's no growth path forward because what you are thinking goes against the natural function of everything else that's happening inside of you. So why would you continue to run with that perspective? So even though it's a very simple change to go and reflect on the internal truth about yourself so that it can be applied to others, that'll fix the racism and hate. But getting people to that point of thinking like that Right. Educating the mass in that aspect, showing them the truth of that matter, that that creational truth. That's the real juice. That's the sauce. And so when we transition into, you know, our book for today to to discuss, it's like, how do we get back to those creational truths that actually strip away all the nonsense, the material nonsense that really doesn't exist for that long? Like Jesus said, things will rust. Yeah. You know? Lucky for us, we're in New Mexico. Things don't rust that quickly. <laughs> you know, they last a little right, longer. Right, right, right. But 
what he's saying is, you know, don't put too much weight into those things. Put weight into things that are truthful and infinite. They're absolute. They are equanimous. They're wise. And they carry real weight, spiritual weight. And I think when we, whenever we look at what we're going to look at today, Arjuna, if I pronounce the name That's right, correct, yeah. Um, that was experiencing this despair, mm-hmm. this moral dilemma, seeing the death and the violence, you know, and the war of his people. And he looked at that. That's in all of us. And yeah. that's that's why I wanted to bring up racism because Interesting, there's man, Arjuna and there Arjuna is in all of us. Yeah. You know, and, and his concerns and his desires, they were all brought forth in this book. And now you can go through each of those and see it, it not really I don't want to say it's a guide. I think it's just a path to I don't want to use this sounds cliche like a path to enlightenment, but it's 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 no, like an, they, uh, it's like a, a universal understanding. No, a path path is a correct term. It's not cliche at all because once you understand a creational truth about yourself and everything around you and what you experience and you're involved with, the truth sits in one straight line. Right. When you deviate from it, that's when the path gets all crazy. But the truth is very straightforward. It's a it's an immensely simple, but we make it infinitely complicated. And so what we're trying to say is let's strip away the complication and lead you back to the simple. And the simple is very straightforward. It's not easy. Right. There's a lot of steps involved you have to take, but it's a long, straight and narrow path. But but I think in following the Dharma, when we get into that, it's it's selfless action. So that seems to be the key through it all, you know? So it's it's you getting past this um, monkey mind mm-hmm. and turning around and looking at it and saying, you know, and it, 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 when we look at this, being selfless, what does that look like when I look at a police officer? Being selfless, what does that look like when I look at somebody that's of a different color than I am, skin-wise, you know? Right. And when I'm looking at them as a spiritual being, you know, how do I interact with that person where I'm elevating their consciousness? Right. Then, Well, at that point, you only interact with them on a spiritual level. Right. You don't talk, you don't focus on the material things. You focus on the things that have the real weight. Right. You know, if you know, you're know you sitting down with like a girlfriend, you know, or if I'm sitting down with Amanda, what's the talking? Did you say a man? No, Amanda. <laughs> oh, yeah. okay, okay. I just want to I could clarify. be sitting down with a man. I'm sitting down with you talking about emotional <laughs> yes, things. Yes, exactly. No, but you know, they want to know. We talk like, to Krishna about this. <laughs> they want to know what's the what's the weighty, valuable stuff of you. Don't tell me right. about the materialistic stuff, what you've done. It's like, no, they want, you know, the your partner would want to know who you are, who you really are. Not not that you like this or you like that or, yeah, or you, what's you're that into worth? a Floral water cutter, water colors. Yeah, water and, cutters. Yeah, yeah, water cutters. I've been <laughs> cutting. Like listen, I've been cutting water, <laughs> dude. For have you years. seen those? Have you seen those water lasers that can like penetrate steel and stuff? Yeah, I I, I get I'm down rabbit holes on YouTube, and I I was watching these lasers, dude. They're it's that's how powerful water is. No, water is incredible. In the we used to I did a large consulting contract for a transit authority, um, on the East Coast, and they had you know we're. They had huge pieces of metal that they cut and they had the huge water cutters and they were extremely accurate. It's amazing. Yeah. You didn't have to use any argon gas to power any like no. you know, purple laser to cut right. through it. You're not using, you know, the blacksmiths, you know, you're just cutting it with water. So when we look at, and I want us to get into um, what we're going to talk about today in this special book that we have, this spiritual, because um, I, I look at the Bible, you know, I look at the Quran, you know, you look at these special spiritual um, the Tao, you know, when you look at all of these, it's something that th- there's something in it that is eternal. Right. And so, you know, um, this prince, right? He was a prince and his name was Arjuna. Arjuna. Yep. Arjuna. He, Krishna is looking at him and saying, go beyond the war, go beyond what you look at. And right. that's, and we share that it's in our intro that you just listened to, you know, it's going beyond yeah. and looking beyond. So let's start in the beginning um, of the Bhagavad Gita. Yes, let's get right. Let's get right, if you don't mind, because I know you've. I know everybody can see it right here. I mean, th- those are all your tabs. Every book, and not only every do you have that one, it. yeah, you have this complete life of Krishna. Yeah, and look at all the tabs. That's you doing all that. So you've studied this for how many months now? Uh, quite a few. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, this is something that you've uh, taken very seriously. I've kind of went into the path of. Because you said, I'm going into this, I'll be going into this, but, and then I kind of went heavy into the Bible, you know, that's been my calling for right now. Right. And this was your calling for you. So we know the words, what they mean, 
the uh, and I want to make sure I pronounce. I'm, I'm so bad with pronunciation. It's the southern roots, but Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad. Bhagavad. See, Bhagavad. I can't. Bhagavad. <laughs> Bhagavad. Bhagavad. People are like, Bhagavad. "Oh my god, this is a real podcast." Because yeah, <laughs> we don't edit anything. <laughs> Bhagavad Gita. Yeah, Bhagavad Gita. It's a Vedic script, right? Well but, over three thousand years old. But I liked what the words meant when it, when I was reading about this. You know, it's a seven hundred verse Hindu scripture, um, but it meant the song of God. Song's an interesting word. Did, did they describe what the word song means? Is it so, because it's <clears throat> the reason you know, melodic or yeah? The reason you talk about song, <clears throat> and this has been very descriptive when people talk about cosmology, is because when you look at creational verses, when like uh, the word om. Okay, right. that resonant sound. Mm-hmm. Songs have repeating patterns, and they have vibrational notes that mm-hmm. go with I it. Like that. It has repeating structure, and so when you talk about creation, when you talk about a song, it makes a lot of sense because it is not only poetic, and poetry speaks to the emotional aspects, but you have repeating patterns, and you also encompass the vibrational aspect of what creation, you know, puts into its natural state. And, you know, in the Bible, when they get into creation, they talk about, you know, part of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, um, you know, coming in and bringing that same song, that same through right. creation and creating through that. Yeah. And I know you meditate and that's the same. That's what's going on, right? Like when you breathe, your bronchial tubes in your lungs, sidetracking for a second, actually vibrate. Right. They create a resonant sound. So natural breathing just natural breathing patterns, don't stress it when you're meditating, actually vibrate the body. And so when you put those vibrations in a repeating pattern, it actually creates a song. And that song moves you back towards the creational truths, and those creational truths get you into that meditative state. I love that. Does that that make "Mm." sense? No, no, no. I think, well, I always picture it like if you had a bunch of people and they were meditating and they're all tuning forks, then they would begin to resonate. Yeah. And then you would have one song. And then it's one song. Right. So the Gita is set, we'll we'll call it the Gita. How does that sound? Yeah, that's fine. A lot of people call it the Gita. (laughs) It's set in a narrative framework of a dialogue between the prince Mm -hmm. and his guide. And they said that probably Krishna was the first motivational speaker in human history. (laughs) uh, uh, Recorded. Yes. Recorded. Yeah. Recorded. Yeah. So the um, it was at the start of the Dharma Yudha, the righteous war. Yeah. Um, and then, and it was between, God, these names are getting, they're, me. they're very difficult. Pandavas and Kravas. Yeah. The Pandavas. So they're, right. they were essentially rural cattle farmers at the time. They were a Royal group. Okay. Through bloodline, um, Aryan bloodline. That's where the original concept of Aryan came from. Um, but, and these cattle farmers, ended up losing their land in a gambling match to this guy called Duryodhana. And he was this terribly evil, awful, dark ruler of the northern part of India at the time. And through certain family ties, genetic ones, and issues with people's, you know, weaknesses through gambling and stuff like that, creates a lot of misfortune, experiential misfortune to these Pandava groups. So he's creating that. He's creating that. And, and we have to realize that in, in world leadership that they can create misfortune to capitalize on it. And they capitalize on it heavily. <laughs> we and so it. what we find is that after this, these Pandavas go off into exile after a series of events, they come back and they are led by Krishna. Right. Who is this deep, dark blue colored being, a uh, cosmic being. That the original said, Smurf. The original Smurf, <laughs> what up? <laughs> and he leads them to say, okay, there is an issue going on here with the the free will and a creational imbalance, right? Where there is darkness in the world, light needs to overcome it. Mm. That was kind of like the major theme. So he said, you've gone through these misfortunes, but these misfortunes needed to teach you something. And again, this is one large cosmic play. And they call it a Lila and Lila, which people, or, you know, or Layla, which is an anglicized version of it. It just means a cosmic play. So it's a drama. So this material thing that happens in our world, our existence right now, it's just a drama that's occurring. Right. And we all learn from it. And so it's like, how do we operate within this drama? And once we realize that it's just a play that is occurring, 
and it's and it's written in song, well, then we can know that we can then work with this play mm. rather than having it drive us in a certain direction. We can actually drive it and its outcomes. So it leads these two warring families, the current leader and this you know ostracized group, together to this holy battlefield. I don't agree with the word holy battlefield or the term, but <clears throat> and they get there and Arjuna, who is the key archer, very talented, can shoot arrows very quickly, very good at, you know, killing off other, you know, demons as they would call it and things like that. And he finds himself. Because in- they talk of, in this, they're talking about just as familiar with the Bible, demons, hell. Correct. Yeah. All of that is brought into this. Correct. And so there's a conflict. Right. There is an internal conflict because of the family ties and lineage. Arjuna is sitting in this chariot with this, his friend, Krishna, who is the, one of these creational beings, which they define as um, a god. A god is just, just to be clear, is a creature of creation. There's creation, all-encompassing, absolute, and then from that you can have things like gods, very advanced, evolved right. that, spiritually. I know th- there's thousands of gods, right? There's tons of gods, and right. that's okay. Yeah. There's not one god for everything, because if you say there's a god, then it's a physical aspect. Right. Creation is non-physical, okay? This is not an atheistic point of view. It's just saying that it's something that encompasses all. And, and do they did they view the gods as being, in this writings, they view the gods as being allegorical, or did they look at it as being real? You no, know, the cause, actual real physical appearance of the so god. So it's like Greek gods, the yeah, same type of... same sort of function. And right. when you look at the Vedic literature, the idea is that this god has come through many different reincarnations. So anytime there's a there's a a bad uprising or an upwelling of um, dark energy on the earth that the God will reincarnate in a new physical form, come down, manage this cosmic play, this drama, and then leave. Do what it has to do, teach us lessons, balance the globe back out, and then leave it at that point. So what we find ourselves is in the middle of this battlefield and Arjuna the archer on the side of the Pandavas finds himself in this emotional turmoil of saying, is this the right thing to do? I need to have an, a perspective on what I think is my reality. I think every warrior has that. Correct. So it's like, you know, if I'm going out to kill, murdering is never a good thing in right. any way, shape, or form. Right. Okay? But these two groups have found themselves together. And so Krishna says, you've made a choice that has gotten you to here, and you're asking for the truth for how creation actually works, right? These creational truths. I am going to teach you to enlighten you here before this battle actually begins. And here's the interesting part. If we think about this metaphorically, you have this dark group sitting on one side of the battlefield. Okay. And then on the other side, you have the light forces and in the middle is a no man's land, Mm. but that's where this golden chariot is being pulled. Having Arjuna and Krishna sitting there having a conversation about creation and the spirit and all of these other separate things separate from time and space separate from time and space and they're sitting in between light and dark they're not on any one side because it's, an, it's applicable to both but it gives the perspective it removes the polarity and has them sit in the center mm, that would be beautiful i'm pretty sure there's paintings on. and that's the framework for where the discussion actually comes out of the Bhagavad Gita. so the gita it says was written by the elephant <laughs> <laughs> lord <laughs> there was um, Cause Ganesh is the, yeah, Ganesh. Yeah. Ganesh is the elephant headed, um, deity. What happened was there was a seer, you know, you, you know, like if you go back in even Greek literature, everybody had like an Oracle, right. Or someone like, that. right, right. So the, the blind King of the bad side, his son was the one leading the army at that time. And the blind King really couldn't get his son under control. So the blind king was sitting back at his his temple asking this seer to clairvoyantly translate what is happening on the battlefield to him audibly. Can you picture that? So, this, so they're sitting in the so they're sitting in between good and evil. They're sitting in this gold chariot. Krishna and Arjuna. Are right, right. Having a conversation. A conversation and then And then the king. Right. Now, who is this king? The, the king is the, he is the the father of Duryodhana, who is the bad guy leading the bad army. Now, is he bad? He isn't bad. He just has a lot of inaction and doesn't prevent, he won't stop his own son from creating this darkness in the world. He's a cop out. 
And so the king asks this seer next to him, this clairvoyant person, this mystic, to narrate what is going on in the battlefield without them even being there. He's seeing it in his mind's eye. And that's the information that's being recorded here in the Gita is that conversation. I love that. Yeah. Of what's going on between Arjuna and Krishna. Now, when, when they're on this battlefield, um, so there's, it seems like from what, what I had gathered, there's ethical and moral struggles Massive. And, they, and they go into what is human life mm-hmm. and then what we face, you know, in this presence. Yeah. So, um, now when we look at Dharma, we look at Hinduism is this is where they're getting their philosophy from, right? Yeah. Dharma yoga, yo- yogis, all that. This is yeah, Dharma. And this is a word that is used many times by Krishna in the literature, right? In this song means cosmic law. So like, if this is how nature works, you need to go with this Dharma, follow mm-hmm. that Dharma. Right. That's why they call it like the Dharma initiative. You ever watched the show mm-hmm. lost? Right. <laughs> yeah. Know? Yeah. Um, it's that, it's that cosmic law. And so what they're saying is if there is an, if people are not following Dharma, then we need to figure out what's going on here. That needs to be fixed. Yeah. And some people call it the, uh, and I know Gandhi called it, um, his spiritual dictionary. Yeah. Yeah. So does it, when you've studied it, cause you've studied it extensively, does it, does it, it doesn't read like a dictionary, does it? Does it in actually, like- no, in some points it does. Um, uh, when you, when they, when we're talking about Sanskrit, Sanskrit has very literal translations. So you can have a word that describes something, but separate functions of it. It's extremely explicit. So yes, it is poetic, but every single word can be talking about the same subject, but a different aspect of that subject. Mm. So contextually, they're the same, but what is the thing that actually kind of molds it to make it a little bit different from the total picture? I love that. And that's why it becomes a dictionary, because there's a lot of explanation. Every single verse constantly repeats things, but there are slight changes in it. So when you look at ancient India and you look at this Eastern philosophy Mm -hmm. and then, you know, a lot of people may be from Europe or, you know, from the United States or whatever, and we have a Western philosophy what are you seeing the difference as you read this and the difference between we as um, Western philosophers, what can we gain from this Eastern philosophy? Oh, cool. Yeah. So the most prominent one that is stressed is the reincarnative aspect of it. That is the number one thing. And that happens from the function of the spirit. And this is something that isn't really picked up on or, or taught over here in our Western ideologies is that the spirit itself is a fraction of the total part of creation. So you have creation and then this fractional piece of it called the Atma. Right. The Atma is the individual piece that sits inside of me as a human being. The para Atma. Is that the soul? Yeah. They call it spirit soul. It's hyphenated. Okay. Right. Spirit soul. Okay. What you call spirit. It's, it's the thing that actually animates the body. They say that that's the thing that actually drives the life, right? And it sits right next to the heart. It's not in it. But next to it, there's actually a seat where this atma actually sits. And para atma is the totality of it. It's all of creation taking a piece of that sliver. And it's like, oh, okay, here's a piece of that creational energy. I'm going to put it inside myself. But that thing never dies. So this is the thing that lasts forever. So the Eastern philosophy teaches that everlasting principle of the atma itself. And that's the thing that is a huge differentiating factor from what we don't teach over here in a Western ideology. If you're talking about a religious standpoint, right? Right. So if we strip the dogma away from it, anything to say that, oh, this is the most appropriate God, you know, you should p- kill people, you shouldn't kill people. If we look at the the real creational aspects of it that you find in the Gita, that is one of the strongest, most differentiating factors that is missed over here with our perspectives. So when we look at this basically eternal message of spiritual wisdom and we're getting into this song of God, because I, I like the word song, and we're looking at creating this song inside of ourselves amongst this war. Yeah. Um, and so we start to look at obtaining peace, obtaining true joy, you know, and because it seemed to be very practical and how to get it, almost like a, is it a how to book kind of? There is, there's definitely a how to book. So it tears itself. It starts with generalities that Krishna gives over to Arjuna. And those generalities are then repeated again with specifics on top of them. Now, 
I don't know over time if things have changed in the translations, but there's a lot of dogmas that have been put in place inside of that that kind of muddle down the important aspects of it. The fact to say that Krishna is the God, the only God of creation, well, to give it a physical aspect isn't necessarily right. He's a creature of creation. Mm. And when you look at it, instead of saying, okay, Krishna is God, but rather a creature of creation, and he talks about the aspects of creation, then the accuracy comes into play with the natural laws of what's going on. So if you start to strip away of the dogmas and what's kind of changed over time, and you can see where they've implemented parts about these people called Brahmins. And Brahmins were these like elevated priests at the time. They're really knowledgeable people. And we've right. seen this in many cultures. That yeah, create yeah, issues. Priests, they're the only ones that yeah, can read yeah, and do yeah. this stuff. Uh, they're the only ones that can do, do It's in Latin for Again, a reason. Yeah. And so what you find in the book, it, you know, there's different parts, but I can't even pronounce this guy's name right. His divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Bhaktivan, Bhaktivan Swami Prabhupada. That guy talks a lot about how he's in a descendant of people talking about how something should happen. But again, he's deciding for the free will, mm. the interpretation of it. Right. And what's nice about the book is that it gives you his interpretation and also the original scriptural thing. But if you talk about the Brahmins, like those are the elevated people and they say like, that's how you have to live your life. Like this is how it should be done. These are the aspects you need to go through or the certain rituals you have to take. Well, that just, that doesn't really align properly. So when we when we look at this in the Eastern philosophy, we can see, and I like this, and some people say Lord Krishna or whatever, but um, yeah. he said this, reshape yourself through the power of your will. Right. And that seems to kind of be the underlying of, I, I like the word reshape. Yeah. Will, 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 is, will is very cool. When you talk about will, will is a conscious thought. It's a function of your consciousness. This means, okay, my will is a concentration on one specific perspective. And if I can concentrate it on it long enough, then that gives me the ability to then alter whatever that state might be because my will is forcing my perspective to change. It allows for that molding to occur. And so if you can use your will to focus on creational truths, well, then it will remold you to look at the world so that you see creation and everything. So you're not like in Western philosophy or Stoicism, you're not looking at it as a will as the end all. No, it is not the end all. That is only the thing that starts the conscious thought of concentrating on something to actually retune the perspective, to get a universal perspective of looking at what they call the Atma, the spirit soul, right. to the grander para Atma, spirit soul of creation. Because if we can all share that, then you see that there's no difference. Because like reshaping your will, like we would look at that and say, you know, it requires discipline and you have to reshape your will and then it makes you the God. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah and there's nothing more than that. Just you. That is not, that's only the through. beginning. Marcus or you know, all them yeah. sit there and had that kind of viewpoint. That's only the beginning. Right. That is the very first step. And that's what this begins to expand upon. I love that. And, um, one of the things that, that he says to us, he's conquered themselves. If people can conquer themselves, and I like that word, conquered themselves. And this is, there's tons of interpretations of this book. Sure. So I'm getting more of a modern. You're doing a great job. Um, conquered themselves. They live in peace, alike in cold and heat, pleasure and pain, praise and blame. Yeah. To such people, a clot of dirt, a stone and gold are the same because they are impartial. They rise to great heights. We were talking about materialism earlier. And this is, and that's another massive aspect of the book. Right where it says there's no real value in material nature. So let it go. Not saying, oh my God, I'm going to live in this highfalutin, just, you know, like you know, ethereal world all the time. I understand that material nature is here, right? but there is a deeper truth within it. And that's what is constantly stressed in this, is that you have to overlook the material. Do not attach yourself. Right. Remember when we, who was the guy who did that book, right? On attachments. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh. The Way to Love. Yeah, The Way to Love by, uh, it was a Catholic priest, right? A yeah. Jesuit priest. This was his adoption of these ideas after he spent that time over in the East. Well, we also see Jesus spent time over in the East too, and he adopted a lot of a lot of these, and we're going to get into that later. A lot of these things are the same that Jesus taught in well, that's the New Testament. Jesus at the age 13, his, his, his name is actually Emmanuel. The guy was born on February 3rd. Second or third. He was actually, he wasn't born during what we call Christmas. That's actually an old Persian holiday for a bloodthirsty war idol. <laughs> yeah. It's, I know, it's, it's, it's so freaking funny. insane. Yeah. Right. 
And the guy's name was actually Emmanuel, right? And so this Emmanuel dude became a learned rabbi by the age of 13. And at that time, in that culture, that's when a man was supposed to get married. Now, he refused his father at that point and said, I don't want to be married. I, there's more I need to learn. And what was actually occurring at that time was the Silk Road, the trade of spices. Right. There was a Silk Road going on. And that road actually brought him over to India. And he left with some Zoroastrians on this trail. And he found himself learning from these Brahmin priests, right? He studied over at Hindu temples for 12 years and then another subset of years until he was about uh, 27, um, until he was about 27 and then found himself back over here after he studied, yeah, the Vedic scripts and then the Buddhist scripts. And then he found himself back on the Silk Road over to uh, the Middle East over in Jerusalem. And that's when he learned his hand healing and all these other ideologies, right, right. you know? And that's the, that's the real, those are like the last years of Jesus or, you know, what we call Jesus, but, uh, um, Jesus, Jesus, right. <laughs> you know, but Emmanuel. Yeah. So listen to this, because this is amazing. Um, please, and like I said, this me. is a modern, this is a modern tradition. I really like this. It says it is better to live your own destiny imperfectly hmm. than to live an imitation of someone who else's life with perfection. Okay. The power of God is with you at all times through the activities of mind senses, breathing, and emotions, and is constantly doing all the work using you as a mere instrument. A gift is pure when it is given from the heart to the right person at the right time and at the right place, and when we expect nothing in return. Right. So one of the ideas here is that your experience, your evolution of your spirit soul, your Atma and the Gita, is you were born with a specific purpose. And if you don't learn who you truly are at a young age, you never fulfill the life purpose, the things that you're actually really fluent at doing. Right. Things that you're truly good at. And what they're saying is that is not a life lived fulfilled. Even if you do something well, really well, almost perfectly, but it is not aligned with truly what you should be doing, then it's a wasted life. So it is better to live it imperfectly with what they're saying, actually trying to strive evolutionary towards what your original purpose was. But the, but the Otman will just go into another meat suit. It'll go into another meat suit. And then suit. it's going to learn. It'll learn again. hopefully it fills that purpose. But it repeats that same cycle. Right. So it's saying is, don't repeat the cycle. Continue to elevate down that very straight path that is albeit difficult. Okay? And so that, that Atma, that spirit soul that we talked about, that piece of creation, that's what needs to be focused on. So a life well lived, they say... Don't look at the material attachments and do what you were supposed to do. Do what you're actually good at doing. When he says it is better to live your own destiny imperfectly than to live an imitation of somebody else's life with perfection. Yeah. That's pretty profound. Yeah, Cause I think everybody's doing that. Everybody's living vicariously. Here, yeah. I mean, when you look in the world, everybody, social media and all that, it's it, that was so relevant to me when I read that. And I, I don't know if it, these are the original writings, right? So yeah, correct. It's a it's a little bit more. This is like a modern interpretation of it. And there's but, a yeah. ton of commentaries. But I already know how where this is applying in the book, so I know right. what you're saying. Yeah. Right. And when you live vicariously, that means you're only looking at the world materialistically. You're only looking at it for what other things are, like differentiated things. Because when you live vicarious, that's saying, oh, that person's so different than me. Mm. I need to live in that right. different character of nature. Mm, that makes sense, right? Why would you do that? Right, that just doesn't that doesn't add up. So if you skip the vicarious and you live in the proper destiny, if you what you want to call it, right, the probabilities of your choices added together, that would be a destiny. Then live it, kind of like half ass, but at least you're doing the right thing that you were supposed to do, and you're not focusing on the material world, but the thing that's everlasting and eternal, absolute truth is what they call it. So when you look at eternal, absolute truth, and you look at what is in us, we look at reincarnation. How do we put that into play? How, how, how is Krishna talking when he's sitting in that chariot? How is he sharing with him these truths so that it would permeate it into him? Right. That's, that is a fantastic question because any good teacher knows that you can't just throw all the information at right. the student. The student has to want the information. They have to ask the appropriate questions because when they ask the questions, that means they understand at their own conscious level what needs to be taken next. So you don't give them more than they can intake at one moment. You build them up in stages so that the understanding has a proper foundation to build off of. And that's how the dialogue works. It works through questioning. Mm. It's a very, it's, it's, 
it's Arjuna asking the question and then there's clarification. And when he comes to that understanding, even if it's repeated three times, then he can ask a more elevated or truthful question after that. And that's how you see the structure of the Gita actually flowing. And that information, is he, is he struggling to take in this information? He is, because when he starts to receive truths, creational truths. This is lies, really important for us all when right? we start receiving truths. It turns your world inside out. Because what you thought was reality was really this frail thing that rusts and was impermanent. And when someone tells you about a truthful permanence of something that carries a lot more weight, it creates a massive change in the, the spirit and the conscious, consciousness of that person at one time. And it's a lot to emotionally deal with. So you watch the emotional ramification of this truthful information coming into this individual who viewed the world, his reality in one way, but starts to get these creational truths, and when they're explained to him, and he can actually logically and deductively interpret them properly, that's when the whole dynamic of perspective changes. That's when the epiphany hits. And that's when all the false teachings, all those outpourings leave, all that weight, all that stress, all those bad ideologies, and the person becomes freed. It's a freeing of that weight. But it's, it's very, um, there's a lot of friction when it comes in. For any information that someone might hear, and it might be like perturbing when you first hear it, like, ah, that can't be true. I can't listen to that. I've only, you know, this is how it should be. This is how I thought. This is how I think. Well, hold on a second. Let me tell you this a couple more times. And then you realize deep seated within you, and they speak about this, is when you talk about a creational truth, even though the person on the outside is disagreeing with it, the spirit, the consciousness of the spirit actually agrees with it and internalizes it, even if the material brain is saying, no, 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 that's not right. And that's why you see so much repetition in the material of the same concepts over and over. That's why you and I repeat a lot of the same things, because we as human beings need to hear things repeatedly before we learn it. Right, that's why we learn songs, so we have courses. Yeah, and that's and it's, it's that repetition. And so when you talk about how does this apply to everyday life, it's like, well, when you hear this material creational truth, don't just throw it away. Don't just you know, be jaggered by it and be like, oh my God, this just doesn't make me feel good, you know, hearing this. Take it for what it is, internalize it, and then logically analyze what is going on with this information. Be like, wow, we actually, now that I start looking at it, it kind of does apply to a lot of different things. It starts to make a little bit more sense. It's a little bit more freeing. And then that's where that's where we find ourselves when we hear these truths. I love that. And when we get into sitting in that chariot and we see that darkness and that light, or uh, did they call it like darkness and light or is it evil and good? Or No, they call it light and dark. But yeah, light and dark. And we look at this darkness. One of the things they say is they talk about hell, which I would be and probably a reference to the darkness. It said hell has three gates, lust, anger, and greed. Correct. Yeah. Lust, anger, and greed are, um, hell is not, a place, it's a state of being when they describe it in the Gita. And it makes a lot of sense. Hell is a perspective. You could live on the most beautiful island here on earth. Oh, yeah. Right? Or anywhere in the universe. Right. But if your perspective is diluted, right, is not looking at truthful things, it's very, you know, dark, heavy, you know, misconfigured vibrational patterns, you're going to be living in a perpetual hell. And that comes through certain materialistic, you know, aspects because right. you attach yourself to things and then they disappear. And then it's like, well, I don't know what to assimilate myself with because my reality is upside down and these things are disappearing that I thought were mine. And then I feel like I own things. And these false ideas put you in this perpetual, you know, vicious cycle that is very difficult to get out of. But our attachments come from these lust, anger, and greed. Yeah. Lust, anger, and greed are like the deepest forms of like the uh, of an attachment that you really get into. That's when the consciousness is really like latched onto things, and these are like the worst states of being latched onto. No, that makes sense though, because when you look at um, when I look at anger, and the ultimate form of anger would be you know to murder someone or something like that. When you look at that, that that there's an attachment to that, you know, and then when you look at greed. There's an attachment of worship to something, or you look at lust. You know, there, there, there's, when you're looking at something and you're desiring it, and, th- and then you get to the point to where you say, "I can't live without this." Without it, then that's, and then you become angry. Yes, and there's stages. So it starts with greed, 
in the Gita. They said there's there's stages for how this goes. So when the 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 de evolving consciousness or Atma, the spirit soul, de evolves when it says, Okay, I'm greedy and then from the material greed, I'm lustful. And if I can't get what I wanted because I feel like I need to want everything, then I become angry. Mm. And that anger becomes blame and creates division. And it gets and it creates it's it's disunifying. So is that like uh so they look at it as levels, like steps. Everything steps, sort of, yeah. Right. They're all they're all they comp- everything compiles on itself. Now to get over this, they mentioned something about understanding, like a complete understanding that we are not the body but the soul. Right. So when you begin to look into perspective of that, now what begins to shift? Well, that's the shift. That's when the material world starts to drop away in its in its perspective, its perceived value. And then you start to look at the value of the soul and like, wow, I'm trying to accumulate all these things materially. Well, why don't I accumulate some like spiritual credits? Right. Because these things are going to go away. I've attached myself to them, but they're going to disappear. They don't stay around for very long. But what does is the, is the spirit, the Atma. So what I got to do is I got to focus on evolving the credits, right? Amassing as much spiritual intelligence, truthful, equanimous thoughts, powerful thoughts. So that you were saying that soul is the Akaman, you called it? Atma. Atma. What does the soul need? It doesn't need material things. No. And, and and we know what happens when we have attachments. So what is it? What is it? Does he talk about like what it needs? Does he yeah. go into that other direction? Of course. So they also talk about the size of the soul. Mm, this is interesting. They say if you take um, a strand of hair and you straighten it out, you know, you know, the hair is essentially a tube, okay? And if we look at the circumference of that tube on the top, it's a really small circle. It says the size of the soul is one ten thousandth the diameter of a hair on end. So it's extremely small. Yeah, that would much be. smaller than an atom. Right. Ex- like very small, but it's infinitesimally dense because it's a piece of creation. So what they say is that it has so much spiritual energy that it doesn't require space because it lives outside of space itself, but it embodies itself in this instrument to actually animate it. So to feed that. To feed that energy, that energy is fed through understanding a creational truth. And when that perspective, that mental perspective of consciousness can come in and align with a spiritual truth, it allows the soul to link up with creational energy. And that's what feeds the body. That's what feeds this instrument. And that's what also enlivens the soul for it to do more. Because you're tapping into that infinitely dense pool of energy. And that's that's the beauty of it. So when we look at this, the essence of God is in us. Yeah. If you want to, if you want to say that in, in Western philosophy terminology, we'll, we'll say, we'll say God. I don't agree with the word God because a God is a, is a creature of creation. Right. So it more properly would be to say, can you read the sentence again, but swap God with creation. Our essence is thus creation. Yes. In reality, we are not us, but what we really are is creation of God, Mm -hmm. who is all pervading, exists everywhere and in everything. That is much more accurate. That is a much more natural, truthful statement, a truly truthful statement. So this is something I want to get into. And I think this is, you know me, I'm always practical. So whenever I look at this, I'm kind of maybe that first layer, I don't know what you call it, but Gita says the demonic do things they should avoid and avoid the things they should do. Hypocritical, proud and arrogant, living in delusion and clinging to their deluded ideas. Insatiable in their desires, they pursue unclean ends. Yeah. Do I, you know, clean, you know, you always, you know, Doc Bronner's. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cleanliness is the closest thing. To I also win. know Doc Martens. Yeah, and Doc Martens. Great shoes. No, they're great. I love them. <laughs> Bouncing souls. But it's, you know, they say cleanliness is the closest thing to, um, I'll say godliness. Yeah, That's right. on his label. Um, you know, again, that's another shared ideology that, that comes from this and doing the right thing is, is clean. They, they talk a lot about fire, right? Fire is something, well, it's hot. Obviously we know that, but it illuminates and it also purifies. 
So if we want to change certain chemical elements, we put a Bunsen burner underneath it and it changes the chemical structure. There's a purification process that happens. So the saying if you take the aspects of cleanliness, that happens through that fire, the fire of thought. And that fire of thought has that heat, that perpetual light that cleanses the body of bad ideas, those demons, the lust, greed, anger, doing the things you're not right, supposed right. to do. So when they say, I'm enlightened, that's the actual cleansing of someone's spirit and consciousness. That's where that idea actually comes from. That is enlightenment at that point. That's the idea of fire, the candle as um, a, a metaphor for things, right? That That's that purification process. So w- whenever we see this scheming, this anxiety, the, the, the lust, anger, greed, and, you know, this desire to hoard money, um, cravings are a big thing. You know, we yeah. see, um, and he talks about all those things. This idea of being self-important instead of being selfless. Yeah. And, I, and that seems to be kind of this, the selfless and acting in a selfless nature seems to be kind of what he's trying to get to understand to, that it's not about us. It's not about you. The, it's really the you. It's really not about you. It's about creation, creating. Right. It's right, almost right. like it's it's feeling itself. If you if I'm a piece of, it's masturbating. <laughs> yeah, it's dude. It's itself. like this one cosmic masturbation. <laughs> you know, it's creations. Like, That's one of our t-shirts. I'm going to split off these shards. Right. It sounds like masturbation. <laughs> right. But those things are going to evolve and learn, and then bring that information back to the absolute truth, which is creation, the source. Right. Splits off, so it's gonna it's gonna implode on itself, and it's gonna spread those out. They're gonna regenerate, and then they're gonna come back into source, and it's gonna go through the same cycle: implosion, regeneration. We talked about this earlier. Yes, yeah. While we were eating. While pizza. we were eating, yeah. And so when we're we're looking at this, it's like, yes, the reason people fall into that is because they miss the true teaching of what is going on. So. They were talking about food. Is that a big aspect? Of yeah, it? yeah. And he's talking about that, like appetite and cravings, the satisfaction. Yeah. Like it's never really truly satisfying. No. And the thing is, it's never truly satisfying. And it's also temporary. There's a huge focus to stray away from uh, a perspective of things that are temporary. Don't focus on it. It's temporary. If you have a craving, let it go. That means you truly don't understand spiritually what you need. Because if you have spiritually what you need, you don't crave. Right. Because Maslow's hierarchy needs is no longer existent. Mm. I have everything I need right here. Right. You know? And that, that, that makes so much sense. Does that make sense? Yeah. One of the things that he talked about that I thought was interesting is that you're going to perform a sacrifice either way. Yeah. You're going to sacrifice that craving, which is going to cause a sacrifice physically in your body, which you're going to, you know, this meat suit's going to go away quicker. So you're, you're sacrificing either way you go. And sacrifice is a, is a bad translation from the actual Vedic term of yajna. I can't believe I remember all these fu- these fucking words. It's like blowing my mind. <laughs> yajna. You studied this, bro. Look yeah. At this. Look at all the rainbow tabs. I know. So a yajna is a sacrifice, you know, in a bad, a loose translation from the Vedic term. But the thing is, you have this idea of perspective. Give that up. Don't pursue that. Do something that you otherwise wouldn't do in a more ritualistic manner where you actually have to regiment yourself to keep you away from this completely ad hoc emotional mess that you've created on the other side, how you typically live. So have this yajna sacrifice yourself from choosing that perspective of reality and move yourself into a very regimented one over here. So that's so, but he, so he talks about having, is it like what we would call habits or, yes. or and having routines? Yeah. Cause those are the words that we would use. That's in, what we would use. Right? right. And they call it a sacrifice because you're, you're essentially giving up, that perspective, you know, like an offering, like here, I'm going to offer up this bad stuff and I'm going to choose to appropriate myself to something over here that more aligns with what creation is doing. Yeah. And I like, there's an idea, uh, cause this is in scriptures too. Uh, Paul talks about that. We're, you know, we have God living in us. This is scriptures. We have God living in us or you yeah. say creation and that we need to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, that we need to be holy, that we need to be all these things. This scripture talks about with the, you know, violence, arrogance, anger, lust, that we abuse our own bodies. Yes, and, we and do. And so we're not only just abusing our own bodies, but we're abusing the bodies of others. Because we, we talked about earlier, if we don't align with what creation is doing, that's like going out and you're like throwing punches at a hurricane. Nature does what it wants to do. So why are you fighting nature? 
Right. Why don't you just act in the appropriate accordance for how nature actually works, creation works, and then you're not going to beat yourself up. You're not going to degrade this system, this instrument, before it needs to be degraded. You can actually enliven it and do a lot more good with it, and you won't be hurting others at the same time because you're living within these creational truths, these creational principles. I love the I love all those gods and all the different um, heads and stuff like that in the way because this one had pictures in it. There's Everybody, over, oh, that's yeah. what I went to and looked at the pictures. Yeah, but I think there's over forty thousand avatars in India. Really? Yeah, they call them avatars. Yeah, that's crazy. Because every forty thousand, every god has its own superpower, and then people are like, "Oh, I like this." Is god. there a moose god? I don't. Like do they a have moose? moose? I, don't I don't know, know if they have moose in it. <laughs> that would be cool, though. Yeah, just because it's just like because the big moose. I mean, yeah, have you ever moose? seen a moose? Yeah, up in Maine, yeah. I have. Oh, in Maine, you saw yeah. one. Oh, like, we saw live? actually. Uh, Man and I saw them over in Arizona. You forget how big they are. They're huge. Even the babies are big. Yes. You know. Yeah. The I, fawns. I, I don't even know what you call baby moose. Yeah, I was. I would. You're just amazed that they would even be like trekking around in the forest. Yeah. Like you just walk around a corner and then there's this. I don't know how tall they are. Dude, but they I gotta don't be, hear them. No. They're, they're quiet, so but they're quiet. huge. Yeah, yeah, they're huge. Yeah, I've always wondered what the plural of moose would be. Is it, mo- is it, is it mice? <laughs> yeah, mice. Oh, moose mice. Yeah. Mice. <laughs> you know what is it? Moose. Somebody needs one of our listeners. Is, is it moosen? Moosen. Yeah, dude, I have. Not. I don't know. Yeah, that sounds like a uh, kind moosen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Or it sounds like a really good beer. Oh, moosen would be. A yeah, moosen beer. beer. Yeah, yeah, like a dark Belgian yeah. moosen. Oh, yeah. That already sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> we we we've deviating off um of a very important scripture. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the things he says that, that we need to realize that everything is a manifestation or an act of the Brahman or spirit. Yeah. So Brahma. Brahma. So Brahma is creation. So out of Brahma, out of it, Brahma incarnated itself into Krishna. And that's where the idea that comes from. So if everything's a manifestation of that, of good, good and evil, mm-hmm. bad and... So then when we... The world we've been living in now is fake and virtual reality. Yeah. Because what we view it as is not what it really is. Right. So every so we we, we basically have the Oculus headsets on and we're living <laughs> this world and Krishna has to come and say... Take those things Take off. Take those off. Here's the what. Because if if everything is a manifestation of spirit, then why would we question evil? Yeah. You don't question it. You just say that spirit doesn't know itself well enough not to commit those evils or those untruths, right? And so when you look at it, you don't look at it as something bad. It's just a function of what is. And then you have this natural sense of indifference, not in an indignant way where you don't care, but you're just indifferent in the fact that this spirit is learning in its function and it's going to be a much longer path because it's not straight. It's a very vicious cycle that that, you know, right. Evil spirit is going through, or you can take the straight and narrow path that is very difficult and requires a certain mindset that will evolve the spirit to the state it needs to be at. That brings it back to that, that point in creation. So when he talks about existence as non dual, yeah, there's no polarity in existence. There just is. It's not good or bad, black or white, you know, any of these other things. Existence is something that just is being. It's just there. It's just, it's just, it's a very interesting concept. Uh, it's non-dual because if you come from a sliver of something that encompasses everything, how could you say it's one or the other? It's not. Right. It's both at the same time. It's, a, it's like saying universal consciousness is something other than that. It's, it's just, just is. one, yeah. It, it's 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 a funny concept. So it's just it just is. So so I'm just as much Hitler as Hitler is me. Correct. Yeah. And so the, I mean that you know people be like, oh my god, but that person had that you know Hitler has that sliver of that one hundred thousandths of a hair tube. He has it just like he, you and he me. He had did. it inside of him, but his consciousness chose a separate path for the evolution of his spirit. Right. His and, and we'll use the Gita of his Atma. So the Atma always wants to get back to para Atma. Like a raindrop always wants to come back to the ocean and it will always find its way. Water always finds its way back to the ocean. The same thing happens with the spirit. And so he's just going to take a longer path. He'll go through more reincarnations. And what Krishna says is that if you can listen and truly embody the teachings, the creational truths I'm telling you now, you don't have to keep going through creations. 
you can come to the higher, more heavenly planes, the, the, the spirit plane. You don't have to keep reincarnating. You don't have to keep going through the, the struggles of material existence. You can just live in spirit body all the time. You can become one with creation again. And when he says God pervades it all over. Yeah. That, that like kind of confused me. Like God pervades it all over. Like th- those, those are interesting words in the way that it, I know it's strangely to English, but yeah. God pervades it all over. So when I look at non-duality, God, God or creation is over it all. No, it's inside of it all. It sits inside of everything. But then we are the ones that say, oh, it is one thing or the other through materialistic aspect. And so, that's where we start creating we start creating that duality. Those dualities, those untruths. And that's what they were sitting in the middle of with that's the chariot. That's what they sat in the middle of. Is So now it's appropriate to understand the the omnipotence, the uh, per, per, what the what was the word? It starts with a P? Omnipotent? No, the P pervades. Oh, pervades the provision yeah. of of you know creation and all of these different things. They couldn't give the speech on one side of the army and not the other. Right. Again, it wouldn't holistically right. it wouldn't make any sense. Right. So that's why they had to be right in the center. Yeah, and and one of the things that I noticed uh, in going over all your notes and stuff like that is that the ultimate goal of human life is self realization. Yes. So and can you talk a little bit about self realization? Self realization is understanding that you are purely spirit. That this instrument, that is the ego speaking, this physical body saying that that is it. This is the key driver for everything. That's not true. That's a, that's a, like that false reality. And self-realization can only happen through an internal reflection. So through observation and then internally reflecting on just clear eternal reflection that gives you that self-realization of what you truly are and what your true connection is to creation itself as it pervades everything and how you are but a fractional piece of the totality. But you still, the thing is, just because you're a fractional piece doesn't mean you don't encompass all of the power. You have all the characteristics of it, all the energy, all the strength, everything, but the self-realization, the higher that is, the more creational energy you can actually embody and then use in your experience of this material world. Everything that we're looking for, everything that we desire, everything that we want. It's all inside. It's all inside. Everything about it. And so that self-reflection, looking inside, looking internally, that self-realization can help you then realize everything else happening outside of you and it can help others begin that self-realization. Yeah, and he says once you realize that, the body, the sense organs. Yes, Mind are mere instruments to worship the divine. Yeah. Uh, worship, don't agree with the word. Um, I think it's another dogmatic word, but the sense organs, they're saying that these instruments are things where you can actually take in creational truth. So I'll observe the beauty of something and know that creation itself has led it to that evolutionary beauty of that flower, right? Or that smell or that thought or whatever that thing might be, all I'm doing is I'm sensing and feeling creation, the physical aspects of it, so that they can come help me learn and then internalize that and find my self-realization to realize that all of those things lead me back to understanding that the Atma, the spirit soul, or the spirit is the real eternal truth. (laughs) (laughs) Holy shit. Well, when you think about that, you said like all that desire to feel creation. Yeah. You know, there's the, but I feel like there's a pull with that. There is a pull because once you start going down, it becomes magnetic and then you can't get out of that path. (laughs) You're like, man, this feels good. This feels right. right." Yeah. And then you feel an everlasting peace that comes with it because you have that truth. So every sort of negative energy or false thing that comes your way, you can never imbibe yourself with it. Not one iota of it because you know what is the most truthfully teaching that's actually self-realized and understood within yourself and how you actually align with creation. Gita says this, just as a fire is covered by smoke and a mirror is obscured by dust, just as an embroidery rests deep within the womb, wisdom is hidden by selfish desire, identifying ourselves not with the body, but the soul at once changes everything. Yeah. So saying it's all right there, clean the mirror off. Get that fire ripping and roaring. Get the smoke away. Stop pouring water on it. You know? All of the truth sits inside of these things, like you know, where there's where there's smoke, there's fire. Right. Well, there's a primary cause 
that creates this other thing that you're seeing. And, and you're going to love this because he, he it goes on to say this. We have an eternal fountain of wisdom, knowledge, and bliss within us as soon as we get rid of our body-mind identification. Yeah. So stop identifying with the material and realize that the this uh, wellspring, this, this fountainhead of creational energy is there. And it's just, it's always just giving energy out. That's the thing you want to associate with. And according to Krishna, this life is just a dream of those souls that have attached themselves to false things, to home, to wife, to the body, to the pleasures, and to all things that signify dualities. Once the soul frees himself from all fetters of attachments and aversions, it attains ultimate freedom or mo- mo- mos- moska, M-O-K-S-H-A. Yeah, moksha. Moksha. Uh, the Gita is a philo- philosophical treatise of Krishna's life. It is a formula to ultimate freedom, knowledge, and bliss. Yeah. Rip out the dogmas. It's a really good way to find some some great truths in there that can lead you down the right path. No, I love that. I, and I kind of want to quickly get into um, something before we um, close. I know that this can be shocking for Westerners. Mm-hmm. and um, Let them have it. Yeah. Because <laughs> we value physical life. Yeah. I mean, that's what we're... We value logic. Yep. You know, that's where we're science, science. I believe in science. Yeah. So uh, we, we value Christianity, Catholicism, Judaism, all that, you know, um, even non-Christians, you know, that may be religious. There's a lot of people that listen to our podcast that are probably that, that yeah. would say that they're just religious or spiritual and they don't fit into these traditional ethical codes that we have built over our privilege. Yeah. You know? So, I, what I want people to understand is that you can find um, similarities in, I think, probably predominantly, the United States is Christian, mm-hmm. and they go by the Bible. So I thought this was very interesting. Um, Jesus, you know, cried when Lazarus died, when it was his best friend that died, and then he brought him back to back to life. Um, Jesus also talked about detachment he went before the religious leaders of the time and told them you know they were worshiping money and religion and all that Uh, he did that but he talked about um specifically about each of these teachings yes and a lot of people don't realize this and this is in the bible this is not a um you know an interpretation these are actual scriptures gita says i am the way sustainer lord witness shelter refuge friend source dissolution stability treasure and unchanging seed that's what the Gita says. The Bible says, Jesus says, and I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Yeah. So um, Gita says, I am the self-abiding in the heart of all creatures. I am their beginning, their middle, and their end. John 1, 2 says this. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. <laughs> yeah, I love that. That's wild. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Same. It's good stuff. Uh, Gita says, he who sees me everywhere and sees everything in me will not be lost to me and I will not be lost to him. Yeah. Jesus says this, for where two or three come together in my name, there I am with them. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. On that day you will realize that I am in my father and you are in me and I am in you. Is That's a, a direct reflection. I mean, a, a direct quote from the Gita there. And then he says, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Yeah, there are so, shared, I mean, there are... D- over and over and over. Should again. you be shocked? Yeah. If, no. this, if this guy, Jesus, spent so many years over there, you would see that there are similarities and shared ideologies. You can go to India. They got paintings in a large amount of Hindu temples of Jesus. Yeah. Exactly. A lot of people don't even realize that. No, yeah. it's it's like there's, <laughs> you realize that this this one influential individual has been in you know so many places and to show that there's so many shared commonalities in the passages. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's yeah. No, it's oh, it's over and over again. And I don't want to get into all of these, but I mean, give me another good one. Um, I want to make sure this one, this one, this one I like. When they know that a day of Brahma, Brahma. Brahma Stretches over a thousand eons and his night ends in a thousand eons. Men understand day and night. Second Peter three, eight with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. Yeah. So (laughs) for Brahma or creation, creation is in a waking state right now. And then it gets to a state of stopping where it stops expanding and then it goes to sleep. That is called the Brahman day and the Brahman night. So creation is in this implosion, regeneration, wakeful sleep day and night. And it's funny how they both share this. And it's (laughs) an infinitesimally very long period of time because 
time doesn't really account for creation because it's something that is infinite. So, um, you know, in closing, because we've gone over an hour here. It's been, a, it's been a solid hour. I know. Yeah, this is, this is really good. And I know uh, we've kind of just skimmed the surface yeah. of, of this teaching that took you months and months and months. Um, and I know you probably would say the same thing. I think with any spiritual teachings, there's, it's like an onion. Yeah, you can't. You can pull back layer after layer after layer. And like, oh, this goes deeper and yes. deeper and deeper and deeper. Yeah. And um, what? so how do you, how would you encourage somebody to study it? You know, I mean, you pr- probably purchase it like I do, purchase it used. Yeah, online. only we buy used do, books. Yeah, books. Yeah. I, always, I always tell people that. Yeah, we go to A books, you know, no, no, thrift books. Which would you suggest out of these two books that you have? And then, and then I want to get into how they should study it. Yeah, I'm glad you asked. The Complete Life of Krishna is the general overview. And so you would start with that one first so you can understand the personality of this of this God. Right. And then from that, you can get into the Gita, which is only a small portion of this God's existence. And so if you can understand the characteristic of this God and its upbringing all the way through, then you can understand how it lays the foundation for what's going to actually happen in the Gita. So is it heavy? I mean, is it something that you it have It is to- not a simple read. Yeah. I'm okay. not just saying that it was a very both of them long. Uh-huh. No, the Krishna one was albeit quite simple, but the actual Bhagavad Gita was a long trodden 658 pages, a very, very explicit, you know, heavy material. It's not, it's not fun. It's just truthful repetition over and over and over and over and over. And with a whole bunch of different dynamics and aspects to it. No, I love that. And um, if they want to get these, you have this one. Um, and you said his name before, but we won't um, we can post this in the show notes. Oh, my goodness. Forget that name. It's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, Baha TV Danta Swami Prabhu Baha. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, they, they need to just have me pronounce them. Yeah, but, we could have a whole show of just me trying to pronounce them. I'm going to just hand you things and I'm going to just pronounce them. <laughs> yeah, that would be the yeah. <laughs> my... Uh, homeschooling yeah. <laughs> Christian education. Listen, if they want to start job. anywhere, just get this book on Krishna. Yeah. The complete life of Krishna. Yeah. By Vana Mali. Cool. And if you want to be a racist, um, Go ahead. yeah, non-duality. I mean, that's think about that. Just keep punching that hurricane. <laughs> yeah. Let me know when you you're win. Gonna, yeah, you're, you're going to go <laughs> your, your next life. You're going to have to, you got to deal with it at some point, right? You're going to be black in your next life. You know? Oh, that would be awesome. You freaking idiot. <laughs> I'll never be black. <laughs> See, now I'm using voices. That's even worse. Wow, well, huh? that's yeah. you know what I'm saying. It's like I always think of like, uh, yeah, I know. I'm from the south, so I, I know. Can't, I'm from the south, so you I can know get away it, with it. Yeah. You know it. Yeah. Well, You've yeah. I mean, it. you're from back east. You see yeah. the the privilege side of things where you have There's to. Tons how many of, forks do you have to have? Oh my gosh. At the dinner table, it's nonstop. I never understood all those traditions, like like Queen England. Well, yeah, yeah. It's I mean, it's got she that. But even even having like having you know like setting tables and then having for and then having like a buffet where the food's over there and then the servants are bringing them to you and then putting it on your plate and then courses yeah it's like why can't it just we we just ate vegetarian pizza out of a box it was awesome yeah it was fine i was so happy (laughs) oh yeah i have to get dressed up and have to act like a total stiff you know Could you I mean? imagine that just for dinner, oh. having to get dressed up? It was a hassle. Like, and we, then you got starch shirts. Yeah, 13 courses in a starch shirt. Ugh. It doesn't even sound like... People actually... Did they view that as fun? I don't even, I don't think it was fun. I think it just made them feel better than the rest of society. Mm, like, this is what we do because we're this class. Yeah, it's not a matter of fun. Putting on the corset is not fun. I just right. do it because I'm better. Yeah, I'm not I'm not a, a simple... I'm a simple peasant. Yeah, 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 yeah. Not outside... Farm charcoal, yeah, you know. <laughs> picking up <laughs> cow shit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's crazy. Well, cool. Well, thanks, Alex. Really appreciate this. Next week, we're going to get into we don't know, we don't even know. <laughs> That's why I love that. I always like that. It's like, what are we going to get into? What book should we read? What should we bring? I want to get into something that I think would be, um, uh, I mean, we can continue with this. That's fine. But I want to get into something that I think is a little bit more practical. Practical. I, love, I knew you. Yeah, no, not there. practical. I want to kind of get into the mind. Well, we did. We just did one on the mind. Yeah. So we did the. Uh, uh, what did? What, what did we call it? I got the book right there. Living the science of the mind. Yeah, science we went of the into mind. that one a little bit. I've been studying a lot of um, 
uh, neuroscience. Yeah. So it's amazing to me how your brain actually, you know, like love is just like two little pumps of a squirt. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so when you think of it Don't that you way, ever say pumps of a squirt in front of me. <laughs> I know, but it's just like this little receptor going, you know, yeah. and then that creates this amazing feeling in your body. So then when you think of that, it just brings it ridiculous. You know, it's like, <laughs> no, I mean, I understand love and all that stuff, but in, in a, in a form of it being chemical, like yeah, oxytocin or whatever. Yeah, it's all that stuff, you know, and the you know, and all these different receptors. What is that love drug of ox? Yeah, yeah it, I think it is oxyto- it uh, oxytocin. oxytocin. Yeah, I think yeah. that's what it is. But then you have, um, you have you have all these different. Uh, wh- what's the one that if you take ecstasy, serotonin, oh, serotonin, dopamine, yeah, receptors. dopamine, and all that stuff. Yeah, when you get thrills, and that we're just hunting for all these things, and we're they're just firing off, <laughs> and that's what's creating reality. <laughs> I guess it's crazy to me. When I'm meditating, I get those pump squirts. <laughs> you start feeling the love muscle, huh? <laughs> I don't even, was it called? Did you say pump squirts? I don't even know what the hell you said. I'm, I don't squirt even, pumps, pump squirts. I don't even like the way the that sounds. No. But but I mean, it's like this little thing going, psh, psh, yeah. and then it's like, if it, oh yeah, then it's good. like, oh yeah, I'm oh, I feel love. gooey. I'm in love. Yeah. And it's like, that's all that was. That's really all it is. You idiot. That's not love. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, but I mean, that's what people. And I don't want to get into this, but um, that's what people perceive it as when we did a whole podcast on love. Yeah, so well, that is not can, even close to what no, love is. And that, that feeling you have goes away after, what, a year or two? Not, maybe not even. Maybe five minutes for some people, you know? <laughs> after you nut. <laughs> yeah, after 30 seconds in your case. <laughs> yeah, after 30 seconds, I'm like, it's time to roll over. <laughs> Ooh, did you feel that 30 seconds I, of love? I was in love. Yeah. <laughs> not anymore. I'm tired. I'm old. <laughs> I've accomplished what I needed to get done. That is it. That is my physical so, existence. Maybe we could do a whole podcast on my new growth of my beard. <laughs> I love the beard. I love the Gerard Butler look. I'm I need to it. get it like a little bit more. I'm going to try to get it down here. I today. want you to What talk? is his name? Unitas? Uh, Leonidas. Leonidas, yeah. I want you to I'm going to be Unitas because <laughs> I unify people. You unify. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> Uh, no one's going to watch to the end of the podcast, so no. they're not going to hear any of this part. Fuck anyways. it. <laughs> yeah, you exactly. know what I got to say about this? This <laughs> is Higher Density Living. <laughs>